Good morning to everyone. I would like to welcome you to the USDA Virginia State University informational meeting. We have several presenters on our call today. We would like to say we would like to welcome you to our program again. And at this time, we're going to have a, I'm sorry, at the end of the meeting, we will have a survey. We have a survey. Please complete your survey at the end of the call so we can make sure that uh, everyone is counted. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Carter Jr., uh, Virginia State Small Farm Resource Center Director. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Carter Jr. with Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to today's informational session. Uh, please ask any questions you have of the presenters uh, in the chat box uh, or at the end of the presentation. Uh, we look forward to you engaging and learning a lot from our USDA representatives. Uh, have a great presentation um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, first, Derek, do you have anything else you want to just say? You came on a little early. Would you like to say a couple more words before we start the presentation? Okay. Uh, we were missing one person, Marilyn Espy. I uh, wanted her to join too. Like I say, I, I know things have been difficult during this COVID-19 um, with the rec uh, restrictions that we have going out and seeing people. But we hope this forum will be a great forum to try to keep in touch with everybody. I think everybody has everybody else's contact information. Any? Okay. Um, okay. Diane, before we leave, can we get everybody's? Irene, uh, Irene said the sign up, sign up for this whole meeting to get that email to everybody on the list. Uh, I have the contact. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you want all of the presenters' information or you want all of the uh, participants' information? Okay. Okay. That'll be all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next, we will have our first presenter this morning will be Sarah Rutherford. Uh, Sarah, we're ready for you. All right, everybody. Hello and welcome. I'm going to start sharing my screen so you can see my presentation. So bear with me for a moment. All right. Can everybody see that now? All right. Seeing some good head nods. All right. So um, welcome again. I'm Sarah Rutherford. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent in Greensville County in the city of Emporia. So I have a, a dual role here. And uh, I wanted to show this picture in my first slide because this is a picture of Dr. Wade Thomason um, in one of his uh, wheat trial fields here. So just to give you an idea of some of the stuff we do here in Extension as well. And a little bit about myself, if I can get this to progress. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in horticulture from Virginia Tech. Um, I have held previous positions as a floral designer. I've worked in garden centers throughout my career, dealing mostly with um, herbaceous perennials, um, woody, woody perennials and things of that nature. And I've also worked in public and private landscaping and design and garden maintenance. So a little bit of background and I've been with Extension since 2017 as an agent. Um, and I mentioned I serve Greensville Emporia area. And I mainly deal with uh, producers um, dealing in horticulture, row crops, forest management, uh, water resources management, and uh, wildlife management. Our mission with Virginia Cooperative Extension is to stim stimulate a positive personal and societal change within the communities that we serve. So this means we're trying to create a more pro productive system for the families, farms, forests, and also the environment where we are located. As Extension as a whole across the entire country, we provide educational and research-based information 
from land grant universities and in Virginia, this includes Virginia State University located in Petersburg, Virginia and Virginia Tech. So um, when you're thinking about resources close to you in southeastern Virginia, this is going to be Virginia State University. They have um, great field days when we're able to meet in person. I've attended quite a few of those. So please take advantage of all the um, events virtually and in person that Virginia State has to offer on this end of the state. So in addition to the two land grant universities, um, which, are lo which are denoted here in the kind of burgundy and blue stars on the map, um, we have 107 unit offices across the state denoted in the black dots. We also have 11 research centers scattered throughout the state. So the closest to us here in southeastern Virginia is going to be the ones in Suffolk um, and the two located over here on the eastern part of the state. Um, and we also have 4-H centers, so Extension isn't just agriculture, Extension is also positive youth development and family and nutrition. So here are those program areas. We have family and consumer sciences. They kind of deal with um, things that you would think about in the home economics realm, um, family financial management, things of that nature. And then 4-H positive youth development. Most of you all probably are um, familiar with 4-H. And then you have people in my position throughout the state as well as the Family Nutrition Program, which really does a stellar job educating youth and adults on, um, who are on the SNAP uh, program. We try to educate them on the best ways to use their benefits and, and create a healthy and sustainable lifestyle. So now to get into the, the bones of what we as agriculture agents can offer to you guys as producers. This is not an exhaustive list of what we offer. Um, it's just kind of a, an overview and this will de fluctuate depending on what part of the state you're in. So um, we do a lot with soil health and cover crop management. Um, consumer horticulture, of course, would be kind of homeowner landscaping, things that the master gardeners take care of. Uh, row crops, vegetable and fruit crops. Um, not as much poultry on this side of the state, but we do have some hog establishments. Small ruminants, we do have a good number of, of goat and sheep operations. Um, Pasture management is a big thing as well as hay management. So any questions you might have, please reach out to your agent about these different types of topics. Uh, we also offer certifications and trainings for those of you um, who need them for your operation. So if you're planning on applying any kind of pesticide that is restricted use, which means you have to have a license, um, we offer uh, applicator trainings as well as recertification courses in conjunction with the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. We also offer a few certification programs for the beef and pork industries, which are our quality assurance programs. Uh, we also um, offer some kind of volunteer programs and those would be the Virginia Master Naturalist and the Virginia Master Gardener programs. And then if you're in the timber industry or thinking about that, we have um, our sharp logger training, which is more for uh, safety of those logging operations to make sure they're certified and um, doing their job well. Some of the services that we provide through extension in the state are diagnostic and laboratory services. So if you need a soil test done for your operation, if you need to identify a disease that has come onto your crop, we can help with that. Uh, we also have our household water quality program as a service um, with the lab on site at Virginia Tech. Um, we also can come out to your farm as agents and assess damages. We can assess um, insect identification if you need help with that. We just want to make sure we're assisting you in any way possible and a site visit will work with COVID. <laughs> we just have to stay apart and, um, and be mindful of that, but we can come out and help you assess things on your farm. Um, we do offer a pesticide, pesticide container recycling program with VDAX um, and the picture in the bottom right here of this slide shows the actual granulation machine that breaks down and, and turns up those containers for recycling. And then we do a pesticide collection program, which in Greensville, it just happened. So these are for unwanted and unused pesticides that maybe you've had around a couple extra years. Um, you're not going to use them anymore. You can't just you know, throw them down the drain. You can't just take them to the landfill. You have to dispose of them properly. So we offer those throughout the state on a rotating basis. And then we've had to amend our programming here recently with COVID, but we do have field days. Um, they can be local or regional in nature, and we've been adapting them for in-person, but 
they have been virtually here recently. Uh, we do var variety trials and test plots. Um, our specialists do this across the state. Um, we do have a couple of locations here in the southeastern part of the state uh, where we do replicating trials, uh, soybeans, um, other crops like that. And we do specialty grower meetings. Um, and again, these have been virtual and in person. Um, one of the most recent ones we had was for pumpkin growers. So we had a virtual pumpkin growers meeting um, kind of with seasonal updates. Uh, we know what are what are some of the issues that um, pumpkin growers are having right now as they're coming into harvest. So we like to do kind of timely up to date uh, meetings when we can and, and virtually is what, what's happening the most right now. Um, so here are some of the resources that we have to offer as well. We have not just our in state with Virginia State and Virginia Tech, but we also have a nationwide network of colleagues that if we can't find the answer, we will go outside the state. We will find somebody to get you an answer to help you with your operation. Um, there is an extension publication website and I just kind of put this up here pubs.ext.vt.edu um, with kind of all of our in-state um, extension research information. There's a myriad of those and I will get to some of them here in a minute. Uh, we also have partnering agencies. We love working with our farm service agency and our natural resources conservation services um, to, to partner on different things. Um, we also partner with financial institutions like Farm Credit and uh, Virginia Farm Bureau. They're often great sources for sponsors, um, grants sometimes, and they help with that education purpose, which is near and dear to, education, um, to extensions purpose. So, and I wanted to hit on this real quick because I can't stick around um, for questions, but questions can be left in the chat box and Diane will make sure she gets those to me. Um, but when you're searching on the web, I can't tell you how many producers I've had say, well, I read this on the web or I found this on the web. Well, we want to make sure we're getting our, our information from credible and reliable sources. So if you use Google, I know this search system works well, but after the Google search over here, I have site colon edu or semicolon. I can never remember which is which. But if you type this phrase, either one of these phrases after your search criteria, so let's say you want to uh, search for diseases in cucumber crops and you put site colon edu afterwards, it's only going to pull up websites with information from an, an dot edu source, which is going to be cornell.edu. It's going to be ncstate.edu. So you know you're going to get a good reliable information. It's not going to come from um, agwebresults.com, something that might not be credible. So I always like to mention that when I'm talking about resources for farmers. And then the publications, oops, excuse me, the publications that we have um, through the state that can help you if you're getting started in farming or if you've been doing it for a little while. Some of the topics are like introduction to labor issues, planning the future of your farm, predicting tractor diesel fuel consumption. I mean, these are things you're gonna have to take in, into consideration as you're moving on with your operation. So, and then I have just a little um, I took a little snippet of the top of this publication, best practices for managing your farm financial health and well-being. So you can kind of see how these are laid out, you know, and um, you can find them again at the pubs.ext.vtu.vdu website. Um, so we are basically here to help. Um, we are here to be that resource for you, reach out to the agent that serves your county or your city, wherever you're located, let them know that you're there, let them know what you're growing, what your aspirations are, because uh, when I was a new agent coming into an area, it was really hard for me to find every single grower and reach out to them and say, hey, I'm a resource for you. So if, if you can take it into your realm to go ahead and introduce yourself, because um, an agent might miss you if you're coming in and you're new. So go ahead and reach out to them. Um, and we look forward to working with you in the future. And of course, if you have any questions, you can um, email me. I didn't put my email up on the screen, but Diane can get that out to you if you need me. So again, we're here to help and thank you for attending today. Great job, Sarah. Thank you very much for that presentation. Next we have Melvin Hill.
Good morning. My name is Melvin Hill from the Greensville Farm Service Agency. Um, thank, thank you for allowing me to be here today to represent FSA. Um, next slide. <clears throat> what is Farm Service Agency? Farm Service Agency is the part of USDA that administered programs that provide a safety net to farmers and ranchers. Next. If you are new to the farm, farm service agency as a producer or a new landowner, you will need name, address, phone number, email address, social security number, entity organization, documentation, survey, plaque, or deed. If you're leasing land, we need a lease from the landowners. Information affiliated by all owners and operators. Be ready to discuss your farming operation and goals. Next slide. As most USDA agency, FSA is also has its shares of acronyms. We have 12 here. Uh, the first one is ARC PLC, which is the Agricultural Risk uh, Coverage and Price Loss Coverage Program that provide financial assistance to farmers that sustain drop in prices and revenue. The next one we have is the Farm Storage Facility Loan that provides for low interest financing for producers to store and handle and transport eligible commodities. Um, example, grain bins, uh, batch dryers, cold storage for your vegetables, and also hay sheds, and there are others. The next one is ELAP. It's Emergency Assistance for Livestock, Honeybees, and Farm Raised Fish Program. Provides emergency assistance to eligible producers of livestock, honeybees, and farm fresh for losses due to disease and certain adverse weather events. And you'll notice I'll use adverse weather events a lot in this, pro in this presentation. Um, that's like hurricanes, uh, flood, um, drought, just to give some examples. Market Assistant Loan, which is MAL, provides farmers intern financial at harvest time to meet cash flow needs without having to sell their commodities, which is most time low at harvest time. LDP, Loan Deficiency Payment. Producer can get that in lieu of MAL when CCC determine the value, which is based on current local prices in a county and below the applicable county loan rates. And in this case, you cannot get both. You cannot get an MAL and an LDP. We call the next one is WHIP, which is Wildlife Hurricane Indemnity Program. This provides disaster payment to producers to offset losses from hurricanes, wildfires, and other qualifying events that occurred in 2018 and 2019. An example, you may have a loss in your soybeans due to Hurricane Michael, which we had in 2018, and you can sign up for and benefits um, or payments. The next one is LIP. Livestock Indemnity Program provides benefits to livestock producers of livestock that death excess of normal mortality caused by adverse weather or attacks of animals. And here you have hail, earthquake, lighting, and winter storms that may affect your livestock. The next one is TAP, the Tree Assistant Program, provide financial assistance assistance to qualifying nursery trees to replant eligible trees damaged due to natural disaster. And the next one we have is a dairy margin coverage that provide protection to dairy producers when different between milk price and the fee cost falls below a certain dollar amount. The next one we call the NAPS, the non-assurable disaster program. This is a, for non-insured crops such as your vegetables that you cannot get insurance anywhere else. 
and to assist in disasters such as drought, excess moisture, and other adverse weather conditions. And the next one is disaster. Um, it's covered losses due to eligible adverse weather conditions, um, including blizzards, disease, and other losses that may occur. The last one is the Livestock Forage Disaster Program. Offers payment to eligible livestock producers with eligible livestock that has suffered grazing loss due to drought due to a normal grazing period for that county. Each county has its own normal grazing period set by the COC. Um, next slide. Here we get into our conservation program. The first one is CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. This is a voluntary program where produce, producers or landowners can enroll their land, a sensitive land, to receive a benefit. Um, the next one is CRP Grassland Program. Um, Landowners and operators protect grassland pastures while maintaining areas as grassland. And these programs also generate a payment in lieu of using your land for another agricultural uses. The next one we call it the SAFE program. It meets the basic CRP eligibility requirements to be in a safe projected area. Um, we have CREP. PREP is part of CRP that addresses specific concern to improve water quality by reducing settlement nutrients to enter into streams and river. ECP, Emergency Conservation Program, offers the repairs of damaged farmland due to natural disaster and help put in place method of water conservation during severe droughts. An example, a producer has cattle and his stream has dried up due to drought. Um, that program, if it's implemented, can assist in putting in water troughs and pipes and things like that so the cows can have water. And the last one we have is Emergency Forest Res Restoration Program. Provides payment to eligible owners to restore forest lands damaged by natural disaster. Okay, and next slide. Corona food, virus food assistance program, which is called CFAP2, provides direct assistance to producers and agricultural commodities market in 2020, impacted by the effect of COVID-19 pandemic, who, who producers who faces market disruption, low farm level prices, Significant market calls. This sign up begins Monday, which was 21st, and it goes through December 11th, 2020. Next slide. Here we have dates to remember September 30th, deadline to update PLC yields. October the 1st, ARC PLC sign up begins for 2021. October the 31st, deadline to submit 2020 organic certification call share program application. November the 20th, deadline to purchase 2021 NAP coverage for apples, blueberries, caneberries, cherries, Christmas trees, grapes, peaches, pears, and strawberries. December the 1st, Deadline to purchase 2021 NAP coverage for honey and maple sap. Next slide. Gov delivery and text message. This is a form that we use to give out information to the producer and landowners. Um, it's very quick, it's by email or text. You can sign up for Gov delivery at your local county office on, or online. Um, SMS text alerts allows you to receive timely information, vivid text message, such as deadlines to apply for programs and file acreage reports and etc. To subscribe to the text, 
you would type in, for example, Greensville, you'll type in 372669, and then you'll type Virginia Greensville, and uh, so forth with other counties like Amelia, Southampton, Lee County, and Hanover. Next slide. And I need to fail to remember these programs are based on approval only. They are not just saying that you're eligible, you sign up and you get in. They are based on approval. Um, my contact information is Melvin Hill Jr., Con County Executive Director, Greensville County, 706 South Main Street, in Port Virginia, 434-634-2462, extension 2. And my email address is melvin.hill at usda.gov. Thank you for this, your time. Great job, Melvin. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Next we have on our agenda is April Fairclaw. Good morning. Hi. Yes, my name is April Faircloth. I am the farm loan manager located in Southampton County, but we cover multiple counties in the southeast corner of Virginia for loan programs. Next slide. And like Melvin just mentioned, he handles the farm programs within FSA, conservation, disaster, price support programs. My division handles the farm loan side, which is what I will talk about. And one point on the third bullet on this slide to take into consideration, beginning farmers and historically underserved, that applies to our loan funding. The difference with that is Congress targets a percentage of our budget and loan funds each year to fund loans for these categories. But all our eligibility, feasibility, and security requirements still apply. Next. And I, I'm not going to read the slides word for word, but some little notes on this one. Um, to make the most of your time and effort, it helps to prepare all your records and business plans ahead of time before meeting with us at the local farm loan office. Um, and that's something that VSU and Extension can help with sometimes, but the more you can kind of prepare and have together helps us in the loan process. Next. So farm loans is a loan program. We do not have any cost share or grants through our section. And like I mentioned, eligibility, security, and feasibility applies to all loan applicants. And now we'll focus on the direct loans, where the guaranteed loans actually come from commercial lenders. And guaranteed doesn't mean that the loan is guaranteed to be approved. Rather, it means that if the bank gets that loan in the government backing on it, that if there's ever a loss, there is the potential the government will pay that bank part of their loss back. Next. All right, these are just some of the uses for what we call operating loans. And operating loans can be broken down into either annual uses, which have to be paid back in full in one year, or term uses that you pay back over multiple years. Term uses would be more like those equipment purchases breeding livestock purchases. And the annual loans would be more annual expenses, like your crop inputs, fertilizer, plants, 
things that you have to pay every year to get that crop going. And one thing to note is for the refinance, we can never refinance real estate debt. And if we're refinancing an operating type loan, like an equipment loan you got through another bank, we have to show the need for it. Like if there's been a setback or prices or sales and you're struggling to make that payment, we can consider it, but we can't refinance things just to lower the interest rate. Next. Okay, our operating loan limit is maxed out at 400,000 for any person or entity. And like I mentioned, the terms can range from one to seven years mostly depends on what you're using that loan money for and what type of maturity we have. Next. A little bit about the eligibility for operating loans. We do like to see at least one year of farming experience and history behind you where you've been involved in the management, unable to get credit from the, another lender, that again goes to us being a government agency. We can't compete with those commercial lenders and take business away from them. And FSA's definition of a beginning farmer is just that you've been farming less than 10 years. It doesn't matter your age, it's just that you've been operating the farm less than 10 years. And like all our loans do require security. And one thing to keep in mind, that last bullet, we do try to get 150% security if we can. So an example of that would be like, if you're asking for a $100,000 loan, we would like to have assets worth 150,000 that are put up for security. Next. Okay, farm ownership loan. That is a longer term loan than the seven years, which is used for the purchase of real estate or construction on real estate that you have. Um, depending on the type of construction, that opens up different environmental reviews and processes we have to go through. And one thing to mention with farm ownership again is we can't refinance real estate debt. So if you already own the land and have a loan against it, we're unable to use our funds to refinance those. Next. And the farm ownership loans, we can go up to 600,000 for any one person or entity. They can be termed up to 40 years Again, it depends on the security and the value of it. And typically we like to start them out in the 20 to 30 year range. And then that just leaves us more room to work with if we get in a tight spot a little further down the road. Next. Okay. Farm ownership loan eligibility. Again, we have to know you can't get the credit from another source. It has to be considered a family size farm operation. Um, and it has to be larger than what is just a hobby farm or like a backyard garden. For farm ownership loans, we do require that you have three years farming experience. And again, if you're a beginning farmer, it just means you're farming less than 10 years, but for farm ownership, we still need to show three years experience out of that. There are some possible substitutions. So every situation is a little different. Um, if you have prior military service with honorable discharge, or you have an agricultural degree, things like that can potentially substitute one of those years of experience. Next. Okay, 
joint financing, that is kind of a hybrid program where we work hand in hand with another lender. It allows you to get part of your financing through the commercial bank and part of it through FSA. The, the biggest advantage to this program is that if you can get that joint arrangement going, the portion that is your FSA loan would be at a two and a half percent interest rate. And that rate pretty much never changes. Um, kind of the catch is right now with that, our regular rate is actually two and a quarter. So if you were doing that today, this program really doesn't provide much of a benefit. But when our rates go up higher than two and a half percent, if you can qualify in this program, it does allow you to lock in at that lower rate. Of course, the rate that you get on the other portion with the commercial lender, it's going to be whatever their going rate is at the time. Next. Okay. The beginning farmer down payment. Now, this program would be open to beginning farmers farming 10 years or less. Of course, if you're buying real estate, we still have to show that three years prior experience. And it's also open to the historically underserved. This program, if you can come up with a 5% down payment on your purchase price, again, gives us a blended program. Then you borrow 45% of your price through FSA at a 1.5% interest rate. And then the remainder of the loan, you have to get through that commercial lender and their rate is set at that growing rate. Um, and there, there are some caveats to the terms on these loans. The other lenders um, have to have amortization of at least 30 years and they cannot balloon it before 20 years. And in this program, your portion, that 45% you borrow from FSA, would have to be on the 20 year term. So depending on the situations and if you have down payment available, you kind of have to plug in those numbers and see what program maybe could get you the best overall interest rate and payment, especially if you're working with another lender also. Next. A historically underserved, and FSA uses these terms historically underserved and socially disadvantaged kind of interchangeably right now. Like we mentioned, the big thing with farm loans is that applies to funding. If your loan gets approved, having that funding set inside in the budget for you each year. And it also opens up like that down payment loan program opportunity. And if you have an entity that is running the farming operation and applying for the loan, an entity can qualify as historic, historically underserved, but they have to have the majority interest of membership held by an individual that meets that definition. And even if it's a husband and wife entity, for it to qualify as historically underserved with the wife, we have to be able to document that the wife has at least 50% or more ownership and is also responsible for a majority of the task or management of the operation. Next. Beginning farmer. So we mentioned this a couple times, but again, beginning farmer just means you've been farming less than 10 years. And if you're an entity, all members of the entity have to be farming less than 10 years. So say like if you had a father-son type operation, had a young son wanting to come into the farm, and we're thinking about the family forming some sort of operating entity, if dad has been farming more than 10 years, we can no longer consider that entity beginning farmer because dad's farmed too long, whereas maybe the son has. So that's just something to keep in mind from that aspect. 
um, the beginning farmer would of course have to participate in the operation. And if they were looking for the farm ownership loan, they can't already own real estate over 30% of the average farm size for that county that they operate in. Next, microloan program. Microloan is a subset of our operating loans and farm ownership loans. It has to be less than 50,000 though. So you have to keep your total outstanding loans with FSA under that $50,000 max to be considered an operating loan. So these are good for some smaller operations that maybe don't need as much financing to get through their year or meet their needs. And it does have somewhat of a simplified application process. Um, if you've got past historical records, we definitely like to see them. They're always the help in making loan decisions, but it's not quite as much paperwork as if you were borrowing more funds. Next. Okay, so again on the microloans, $50,000 limit. Um, the uses are the same as the other operating loans. For, so for your annual crop inputs, breeding livestock, machinery and equipment would be eligible uses of the funds. Next. So eligibility for the microloans. You still have to meet the same eligibility requirements as other loans, like having an acceptable credit history. Now we're a little different than commercial banks. We will run a credit report, but we don't necessarily base anything on your credit score. We're more looking at your history. Were there late payments? Are there judgments? collections, um, how many of them, it, and if there are, what are the circumstances surrounding those accounts? Again, we have to make sure you can't get the credit from a commercial bank, so even though it's a smaller loan amount, if commercial lenders willing to do it, we can't take that business away from them. All our loan programs, we do have to verify that you're not delinquent on any federal debt. So federal student loans, federal mortgages, things like that. And you have to be the owner operator of a farm. And, and that's one thing with all our loan programs. We can't make a loan on something that say you're going to just turn around and rent out or you're going to have somebody else full time manage your operation the loan applicant really needs to be the one operating that farm. And we do have, again, managerial ability requirements for all our programs. Next. So the microloan eligibility experience can be a little less than our other programs, because you are looking at a smaller amount of money. So the bullet kind of gives some examples of what can count towards eligibility for microloans. Um, so if you manage another type of small business, again, if you have the education, if you've participated in 4-H, FFA, agricultural pro projects, and also if you have a mentor who's experienced in the type of oper operation you're looking to start and they're willing to kind of sign on not as a participant on the loan but that they're willing to help you in your first year of operation and kind of walk with you side by side for any questions you have when it comes to production or marketing and let you kind of benefit from their past experience, we can consider that mentor relationship. Next slide. So a microloan for a farm ownership loan, again, would just be like a real estate purchase that was $50,000 or less would be considered a microloan. 
we still require that three years prior experience. And then that last bullet gives some of those examples of how we can potentially substitute one of those years if you had prior experience on another operation. Next slide. So collateral. The collateral is a little different from the microloans. If it is an annual operating loan, if you're using that for your annual operating expenses, fertilizer, feed, seed, chemicals, anything like that, minimum is we have to have 100% security. So if it's a $50,000 loan, we need security worth $50,000. We will try to get 150% if we can. So $50,000 loan, we're going to try and get $75,000 worth of security. Term operating loans for microloans, which would be breeding livestock, equipment, or typical examples, have to be secured at just 100%. So if it's a $50,000 loan to purchase a few pieces of equipment, we would be looking for $50,000 worth of collateral. And for the microloan, farm ownership loan, again, we'd be looking for the 100%. So if you're purchasing a parcel of land for $50,000 and its value is $50,000, that would be our security for that loan. Next slide. Okay, just some tips when you are pulling together information for the loan application. Of course, all our FSA application forms are available at your county office or online. Um, good thing to do is definitely plan conservatively, especially if this is a new operation. Yes, we hope you do a lot better, but we want to do it kind of on worst case, best case scenario to be able to show that even if sales or production isn't quite what you planned, we're still going to be able to generate enough income to meet those minimum expenses and loan payment. It's good to have the records and support behind your production in your projection. So record keeping is big with FSA. If you're starting an operation, even if you haven't started sales yet, keep records of what you're producing on that area of land. If, you're, if you have sales, keep records of your sales. If you're going to the farmer's market, how much are you selling there each week? And then same thing with your expenses. How much does it cost you to generate that production? And again, it, it's great to work with Extension, BSU, VDAX, different programs have options out there, especially for those getting started. Um, Extension has budgets for a lot of crops to give you an idea of what your expenses are going to be and what income you could potentially expect based on the crop you're working at. Next slide. So just kind of in summary, FSA has direct loans, which break down into operating loans and farm ownership loans. Subset of that is microloans if you're looking for 50,000 or less. We do have targeted funds for those who are considered historically underserved or beginning farmer. That applies to both operating loans and farm ownership loans. We do have a few different programs where we can partner with other lenders in the area to help fit the situation. And again, just mentioning the microloans, those are usually a good fit for smaller operations and maybe those that don't have the experience requirements of other loans to kind of get your foot in the door with a smaller loan amount, build up that history, keep those good production records and those good financial records and then maybe in the future, if you 
interesting and you need to borrow more funds, it'll help in that aspect. Next slide. And of course, this is just a map of Virginia, and this shows the different loan office territories in our state. So we have seven different loan offices and that in the red corner is Cortland. That is the office I'm in and that shows the counties that we serve. So like if you're in Chesterfield, you would be covered out of the Boynton FSA office or Hanover is covered out of our Fredericksburg office. But of course, you know, if you just call your local FSA that is in your home county, or even if you call here, you know, and you let us know, hey, well, I'm actually in Louisa, I can try and answer your questions and give you the information you need. But I'm also going to say, hey, here, here's the contact for Fredericksburg. So you might want to go ahead and get in touch with them, because if you do choose to apply, they would be the ones processing your application. Next slide. Okay. And this is just a link to our website um, that has some good information on it. It can be some overwhelming information at some times, so they are a good start, but I, I always suggest, you know, calling your office and talking to somebody who works in the farm loan programs to get your specific questions and situation addressed. Um, and I don't think I got my phone number on here, but for the Southampton Farm Loan Office, our phone number is 757-653-2532. And I think that's all I had today. Um, I'm not sure if Y'all wanted to open it up for questions, if there are any questions. April, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, Mark, do you see any? Uh, no, I don't see any. I'm, at I'm sorry. I do have a question. Oh, sure. Okay. For... Um, I guess the eligibility on a lot of these, you mentioned the farm experience. So what actually counts as farm experience? Does it mean you need to be selling that particular produce or product or just overall experience? Um, that kind of a lot depends on the situation with that and the type of loan you're requesting. Typically what we like to see is management experience. So, you know, responsibility for decision making. Did you decide when to plant? What varieties to plant? Um, if you had to spray any type of chemicals for bug problems, anything like that, how involved were you in that? Um, now, if you don't have sales, you wouldn't necessarily have the marketing aspects, which we like to see also, you know, did you decide where to sell this? what price to sell it, when to sell it, things like that. Um, but if you've had a small scale where you just have the production side, if you've got good records and you have been involved in that decision making, there's potential, depending on what type of loan you're asking for, that that could qualify as experience. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, if there's not any more questions for April, April, I really appreciate you today doing the presentation. Thank you. You did a great job. Next, we have Keith Boyd. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'm Keith Boyd. I'm the uh, Assistant State Conservationist for Field Operations with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, I cover most all of Southside and Southeast Virginia. Um, there's a lot of NRCS folks that um, you could be introduced to that work out of the many different service centers throughout um, Southside, Southeast Virginia. We've got offices in 
um, our service centers, they're co-located with FSA and extension is always close by too. So, um, <clears throat> but anyway, we have offices in Lawrenceville, Cortland, Dinwiddie, Emporia, Chatham, Smithfield, um, Charlotte Courthouse, Boyton. So you're probably close to one of those offices. So you'll be able to make some relationships with uh, many of the people that you've listened to here today and, and some new folks that you'll meet. Um, Mark, give me the next slide, please. In um, NRCS, we offer um, several different um, services uh, to help you conserve your natural resources. Um, our mission is to you know help people help the land. We want you to get the most out of your natural resources that you have on your farm. Um, in this slide here it says first steps, technical versus financial assistance. Really, it's not versus, it's technical and financial services. We have some of both. Um, and our technical services, a lot of times those services are provided jointly with members of or employees from the soil and water conservation districts. A lot of that comes from your extension agents, the extension service. Um, so there's a lot of technical um, assistance out there for farmers and landowners. Um, also lots of financial assistance. You heard a lot from FSA, the Farm Service Agency, but we have a lot of um, financial assistance as well through some different farm bill programs that we have. So um, Mark, next slide, please. Um, our technical assistance. Um, NRCS works with, with any farm of any size um, in the past couple of decades, we've really become um, develop a, a kind of a new focus on small, more urban type farms. So that's been kind of an exciting development. Um, you know, historically from the from the 30s on up, we traditionally work with, you know, big farms and we still do. But but now we're really trying to put a real effort on, on small farms and, and also urban farms as well. Um, our technical service is free. Um, all you need to do is make contact at the service center um, and we'll come out. Uh, we'll, we'll do what we call our nine step conservation planning process. Um, all of our staff have four wheel drive trucks. It's our mission to get out and to intimately know your land so we can help prescribe the best financial options um, to help you meet your needs, to help you develop the vision that you have for your farm. Um, it's kind of, um, exciting to see what's going on out there. And one thing we like to say is no two acres are the same. No two farms are the same. So what works in one place may not be just right for the next. So um, we like to work one on one and do this nine step planning process to kind of to steer you down the, the correct and, and best path for potential financial assistance. Next slide, Mark. Um, we, we like to call um, challenges on the farm, we call them resource concerns now. In years past, we called them problems, um, natural resource problems. There was water quality problems. There was animal waste problems. Um, there was erosion. Erosion was a big one. That was the one that really started us as an agency from the Dust Bowl. The wind erosion from the Dust Bowl is what really created us as a nationwide agency. Um, but through the decades, we've um, we've done a really good job, and you know farmers have done a wonderful job of helping to control erosion. So one of the big new resource concerns we call now is soil health. Um, I think you heard Sarah Rutherford mention this. This is something that we're working really closely with Extension and the universities, Virginia Tech, Virginia State, um, NC State, all all the land grant universities across the nation are really focused in now on how we can rebuild our soils and get that health back into the soils. So that's a resource concern. You might say that um, my soil is not as fertile or the structure of my soil is not what it used to be. Um, so that's the resource concern. We wanna rebuild that. I personally like to say that your soil, that's the real wealth of your farm. That's your rural infrastructure is the, is the soil that we have. So um, 
Anyway, resource concerns is what we look to address with our planning and with our financial assistance. Next slide, Mark. A little bit more about the financial assistance. Um, uh, we have EQIP um, and CSP, and so the, and we have some easement programs that we also use to help on farms, but we also have some, um, some other challenges or, or, or regulatory stuff that we have to work with. We, we have to work with highly erodible land and wetland issues on farms. We have to be careful that we're, we're working to preserve and not damage wetlands if you have them on the farm. And also we identify land that would be considered highly erodible land. Um, if you have highly erodible land on the farm that needs to be addressed to keep you in compliance to be eligible for our programs. And adjusted gross income is one as well. And that, that we work hand in hand with the Farm Service Agency to ensure that, that we um, meet the requirements there. So, Mark, next slide, please. Equip options. Now this says, the slide says options for 2020. Um, Equip, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, that's what that stands for. Um, we have that every year. This is not just 2020, it'll be here in 2021 and 2022. These programs change a lot with each farm bill. You know, Congress um, enacts a new farm bill every four, five, six years. And the EQIP funding or the conservation programs funding change with those. But typically we cover, we have programs to cover cropland issues, grazing land resource concerns, forest land, livestock, and organic farms. So EQIP is a program that that's the, the mainstay, that's the main tool, the biggest tool that we have in our chest to address resource concerns on your farm. Next slide, Mark. Wildlife programs, that's that's another one that we do. There's a lot of interest from farmers to um, um, you know try to tap in and best manage for, for wildlife. Um, we have a, in Southside, Virginia, there's a big push for, um, to help improve quail habitat. Um, we have a, a resident biologist in Smithfield, Virginia, that covers this part of the world. His name is Bob Glennon. He's a joint employee of the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, he has a wealth of experience and he's wonderful one-on-one. -on -one with landowners and he comes out and he will um, help identify the best opportunities to plant native species and um, try to do things to help improve habitat for quail and other other um, game species. But um, as the slide says, we're, we're obligated to spend a certain percentage of our um, equip allocation statewide annually to wildlife programs. So next slide, Mark. Special fund pools. We have um, different different scoring for folks of um, in, in different fund pools. We have the veteran farmers, new farmers. We have limited resource farmers. These are all just different categories that you can apply to when you're applying for these the financial assistance with us. Um, that kind of it, it bumps your score up a little bit. And let me explain that a little bit more when I talk about fund pools and our financial assistance, when you apply for financial assistance with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, it's like you're applying for a grant. And we, we come out, we do the plan with you, we, we start the nine step process and you will get a score, um, a numerical score for the value of your project and what the, the benefits to the environment that that's going to create and how much good it's going to do. Um, and that goes into a big pot enrichment and it's ranked against everybody else in the state of Virginia that wants to do similar projects. And then the highest scoring ones get approved. You win a grant, you might say. And we do that until we run out of money. So every year, there's a bunch of folks that don't get funded, that would like to get funded. Um, and we defer them till the next year. And hopefully, we'll eventually get around to them and hopefully we can get everybody funded and we can address all the resource concerns. But the reality is 
the funds are limited and we can't we, we can't fund all of them um, but technical assistance is always there and we can always work with you to try to get you the information you need in the in the service that way but we may not always be able to do the financial but we'll do our best um, next slide please mark livestock programs um, you know the the livestock programs are typically grazing land management um, improved forages that we can put on the land um, fencing to do rotational grazing um, that's a big deal trying to best utilize and manage the um, forages that you're growing on your farm um, we also provide water you know, we try to protect the, the, the water systems on the, on the landscape, the streams and, and rivers. We, we try to keep livestock out of those. So we'd like to develop water and put up fencing so we can keep livestock out, out of the streams. And um, there's a lot of good work that we can do with livestock farm. And we, it's um, really enjoyable to do that. Um, livestock can create a big um, water quality concern. Um, particularly up in the Shenandoah Valley, not so much in Southeast Virginia, but in other parts of the world, livestock are a big issue. Um, just from the manure alone can be a big problem, big challenge, but um, also overgrazing of pastures. Um, next slide, Mark. As you can see here, this um, several years ago, people may not have seen an issue here. Um, but what we see here is an absolutely completely degraded pasture. You can see there's no food source here for these livestock. And if you see there's a drainway going through there, imagine what the water looks like during a rainstorm coming off of this site. Um, that would be some terrible water going down to your neighbors below and then below them and then into the Chesapeake Bay. So it's a, it's a high priority for us to spend money on our livestock concerns to try to ensure that we have clean water. Um, and it's also definitely a benefit for the landowner because he's not getting any, any value out of that acre of land right there to provide forage for his livestock. Um, next slide, Mark. Just another example of a, um, an overused area um, where it's just, this one is fenced in. This, I'm not specifically familiar with this. This might actually be a sacrifice lot. Sometimes, sometimes on farms, particularly dairy farms, we have to have places like this. We can't always be green and lush everywhere. Sometimes we have to have um, what we call a sacrifice area. And our, our local DCs and soil conservationists can help identify those spots where places on your farm where we could fence in, where we can have a mucked up area. It's like the, 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 the less of all the evils. So um, next slide, Mark. Uh, here's, this, here's an example where we've um, kind of, we fenced the cows out of the stream, um, trying to um, protect, protect the waterway there. Hopefully we'll get a kind of a buffer zone growing up. And uh, so that, that's kind of one of the projects we can do, with the, the fencing that will um, keep the livestock out of the stream. Next slide, Mark. This is a picture of a, of a, a typical um, frost-free watering system that we put in. In the previous slide, um, in years past, in generations past, the farmer may have just allowed the cows access to that creek so they could have had water to drink in that creek. But now we install waterers such as this. Um, sometimes they're attached to a well and they're um, an electric pump will pump water to this and the livestock can get their, their water here. Sometimes it's a spring development and gravity fed to it, or and sometimes we have solar pumps um, that, that get water to these troughs. Um, the soil and water conservation districts who are normally also located in the farm service agent in the service center with FSA and NRCS, they have a state cost share program and they have quite a bit of money to install projects like this as well. So if you have livestock and you want some to improve your watering scenario, um, 
there's typically ample financial means to do so. Um, and not only are we keeping the, the water clean in the streams when we install waterers such as this, you're also providing a much better water source for your livestock. So animal health is a real benefit here. Um, so you should consider these. And we, we, we take great pains to um, stabilize the area around the trough because this is going to be a place where you have concentrated animals. So we want to make sure that we put the gravel down and the concrete base to keep that area stable as well. Next slide, Mark. Just another example of an extreme stream exclusion riparian buffer. This may have been a or likely was a CREP project. You heard Melvin speak of the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, CREP. And if you'll see, there's some plastic tubes where we have actually are implanting hardwood trees alongside the stream to create that natural forest buffer, sh start to shade the stream so we can keep the water cooler and cleaner. We got the fence to keep the livestock out of the stream. So just so many benefits to a project like this. Obviously this is early on, but try to picture in your mind, maybe 20, 20 years from now, what this stream is going to look like. It'll be a nice shady region down there and be a beautiful little brook. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide just shows typical prices, um, cost sharing prices um, that we pay for equip livestock practices. Now these are subject to change. Um, they do annually, but this is kind of what we're, um, a, a, a typical cost estimate, which you could begin to look at and, and think what might be available for your farm, but obviously it would be custom designed in, um, for your operation. Next slide, Mark. Another really popular program that we've developed in the last 10 years or so is our high tunnel systems. Um, these are basically unheated greenhouses where the federal government through the um, EQIP program will um, help you purchase and install a high tunnel, um, which is designed to um, enhance the solar energy, basically. I mean, it's, we're, we're capturing more energy from the sun. We're going to increase your growing season. This is this is really beneficial to folks raising vegetables and trying to hit a, you know, the farmer's market scene or in the urban area where we're actually able to extend the growing season several weeks into winter or much earlier in the springtime just by being able to capture the sun's energy. You know, it gets warm in your car when your windows are rolled up. And the, and the sun shines through the windshield and you get in your car, it's always warm in there. Well, that's the same effect that we're getting with these high tunnels. Um, they are extremely popular um, and they call it their um, a great benefit. Now there's a lot of rules to follow in order to be eligible for this. We get a lot of folks that hear about this and they come in and they want a high tunnel, but they don't have a farm in history. And you know, they, they so it's, it's, you gotta, you gotta be able to, um, meet all the criteria to be eligible for the high tunnels. Next slide, please. Um, here's some um, information about what it takes to be eligible for the high tunnel. I'll give you a few minutes to read that. Next slide, please, Mark. Um, one of the things we get, get also is, you know, people that want the high tunnel really haven't been in farming business. And, you know, we have a special fund pool for new and beginning farmers. Uh, I don't recall exactly when you become, when you get out of not being a new farmer, but a, a new farmer might be someone who's been farming for two, three, four years. So, um, so 
when we say a new farmer, that doesn't mean you need to be brand new. And for in the case like the high tunnel, you have to have been farming enough to actually have that little bit of farming history to be eligible for the high tunnel. Next slide, please, Mark. Just some information too about the um, uh, the payment rates for the different um, high tunnels. And we mentioned you'll see there's the um, Quonset style or the Gothic style. These are just little engineering changes or differences in the high tunnels that you can go for. If you're interested in one of these, I would um, I would suggest you contact Virginia State University. They have um, examples of most all of them on the farm there. They're in Ettrick. It's a wonderful resource to check out the, the different types of um, uh, high tunnels there. Now, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, when you could actually visit them with the, um, uh, you know, with now with the COVID restrictions and all that we're dealing with, but maybe you could give a phone call or just do a Google search and you could get see pictures of the different styles and you could learn about the, the benefits and the negatives of the various types. Next slide, please. Um, how to get started. Um, you need to come in, you need to establish a relationship with the farm service agency, get yourself a farm, farm and track number, get in the USDA system, you might say. Um, and then you start off with the application, that's the 1200 form. Um, and you would do that right there in the service center. Now, with the COVID restrictions right now, we're not taking visitors inside the service centers. We're still in kind of a lockdown, but most people are still going to the service center. And you can, you as a producer or farmer can go to the service center and there's typically a phone, there should be a phone number there on the door. You can call that phone number and someone from inside can come outside and we'll meet with you with social distancing and mask. And, and work with you there to help address questions and file and fill out paperwork. Um, it's probably best to call ahead of time to call your local service center to um, make an appointment. Um, so that would um, just to make sure you don't do any unneeded running around. So um, next slide, please. Um, uh, once the paperwork's done, you've made your application. Um, you know, we'll do the farm planning. We'll develop maps. You'll see, you see the sample example of the aerial photography. We call them conservation maps, plan maps. We'll, we'll develop a plan um, and you'll get aerial photography with a really nice maps drawn out with um, what the plans are and um, the placement of the various practices, fencing, the high tunnels, the waterers, um, things of that nature. A lot of farmers love getting really good maps of their farms. So next slide, please. A uh, little bit of timeline. Um, you sign up for the program. Um, then at the, at the end of the ranking period, uh, then we'll, we'll, the state office will decide which ones, you know, win the grants, you might say. Um, then we, once you get pre-approved and then approved, we'll have to develop the contract because you won this grant and you, de you actually develop a contract at that point um, with the federal government. So it's uh, all the bureaucratic red tape that you can imagine to go along with that. It's there, um, but we'll help you work through it and we'll get it done. And then after we all have an approved and assigned contract, then we can do practice installation. You never want to make this, make the mistake of applying for to do something and then get started doing it and then hope to develop a contract because if you're actually if you actually implement the project we cannot come back and fund it after the fact so if you're applying for something you can't do it until you don't want to start it until you actually get a contract in place to do it. And then once you get the contract, then you go through the, ins you install whatever it is. Um, then we'll, ins you let us know that it's done. We'll come out and inspect it and then we'll make payment. So next slide, please. Oh, the funny cow. <laughs> so any questions you might have, um, 
I may not have specific answers. I'm, you know, I, I, I kind of work at a more regional level. I, I, so I don't get a whole lot of experience one-on-one -on -one and working through the minutia and details. And like I said, each application and each farmer is specific and different. Um, so I would encourage you to, to identify and work with your local people and uh, there'll be a world of help to you. And those are the FSA, the extension agents and the local district conservationists. So, with that being said, um, that's the end of my presentation, and I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Great presentation. Next we have up is David Kanal. David, we're ready. Good morning. My name is David Knopp. I'm the Regional Director of USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service Eastern Mountain Region, and that includes the state of Virginia and four other states. Our purpose within USDA is to gather information from farms about the production of crops and livestock and then make that information available. Predominantly, that's information that is useful to, to farm operators and, and agribusinesses to make business decisions, but it's also information that's, that's useful for USDA to administer programs and to um, benefit the policy decisions that are, are being made. Next slide, please. In addition to uh, conducting surveys on a, on a regular basis, basis we also conduct the census of agriculture every five years and that's a very detailed comprehensive type of project to be able to make a, a measurement of, of agriculture in in each of the counties and so the the information gets gets very local at that point and so then becomes available for use uh, in addition to um, the the uh, information I've already shared as this slide says that and the universities are a, a big user of the data as they work to provide education and conduct research for for farming. Next slide. As I said the, the primary reason that that USDA publishes reports on, on crops and uh, the the production of crops and for livestock is to, to make that information available to the people that are in the business. And so we want you to, to have that information available as a, as a farm operator, or if you're, you're someone that's interested in possibly being a person that is raising crops or livestock, have the information available so that you can make the best business decisions possible. And of course, we all want to have profitable operations and uh, that's, that's a part of that process as well. Next slide, please. So as I said, um, you know, FSA, uh, RMA, NRCS, uh, Rural Development can all use this information as they are uh, making program decisions and implementing policy that uh, comes out of the, the farm bill. And so um, it, it is valuable, not only for, for individual farms, but for the whole process of um, supporting the, the farms that are producing the crops and the livestock. Next slide. In order for you to be represented and for you to be able to uh, contribute to the information that is, is in reports, uh, it's necessary, necessary for you to be a part of either the survey process or the, the census of agriculture once every five years. And so that's really um, the, the point that I want you to take away uh, today is, as well as knowing that the data exists and, and how it how it can be used, uh, we want to make sure that that you're represented. So if you go to the next slide, please. 
the way that you can can do that is to uh, go to our, our website nass.usda.gov and there is a, a rotating banner that is on that screen and one of them will come up that uh, you can click on to sign up to be be counted for our surveys and, and our census. So um, if you are a, a current producer and uh, not, not already represented, if you would go ahead and, and do that, uh, we'll make sure that, that you're going to be counted in the, the next census of agriculture. And then the other information on the slide there, and it's, it's at our website, of course, is the, uh, the, the 2017 census, which was the most recent one as well as the, the uh, censuses that have been conducted prior to that. So if you're looking for some information about your county or about the state of Virginia, for example, that's the, that's the place to go to, to get that kind of information. Next slide. So we are here to, to help you in your business operation, what, uh, whatever you choose uh, to do. We have a, an office in, in Richmond, and Herman Ellison is our, our contact there, and so his information is here on the screen for you. So please reach out to him if you have specific questions and uh, know that, that we wanna be here to, to serve you as you produce crops and or livestock. And I believe that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, David. Great presentation. Next we will have up is Joe Boltwright. Good morning, everybody. Um, Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Joe Boatwright with Rural Development, here to talk to you about a couple programs, the Value Added Producer Grant, the Rural Energy for America Program, and our Business and Industry Guarantee Program. <coughs> uh, next slide, please, Mark. And Rural Development's mission. Uh, next slide, please. We have three separate agencies inside of rural development, which are the Rural Business Cooperative Service, the Rural Housing Service, and the Rural Utility Service. Next slide, please. And this is our website where you can pull up any pertinent information. Next slide, please, Mark. And partners with ag in a couple different programs. Next slide, please, Mark. The first program is a value added producer grant program, and it is basically for ag producers uh, to be able to market their products and changing the state of ag uh, of a product from like milk to cheese, strawberries to jam, uh, to help them market their program. Next slide, please. Who is eligible? Next slide. Independent producers, ag producer groups, farmers or ranchers, cooperatives, majority control producers, based business ventures. Next slide, please. And how may the funds be used? Next slide, please. Working capital expenses. Next slide. And planning activities. Next slide, please. Second program we're gonna talk about today is the Rural Energy for America program or the REAP program. Next slide, please, Mark. Grants and loans are available for installing renewable energy systems and for energy efficient improvements. Next slide, please. Who is eligible? Next slide. Ag producers. Next slide, please and rural small businesses based on the SBA definition of small business. Next slide, please, Mark. We can do energy efficient items 
to uh, buildings to help increase uh, lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, fans, automatic controls, insulation, anything that will uh, increase heat efficiency and conserve energy. Next slide, please. In our renewable energy program, we have solar, wind, small hydroelectric, uh, anaerobic digesters, biomass, geothermal, or wave or ocean power. Next slide, please, Mark. And uh, before we get to the BNI CARES Act, which is our uh, new program initiative this year, I will say that the REIT program and the value added program were both run by Laureate Tucker, who is one of our state offices em employees uh, located in Farmville, and she does an excellent job. The BNI CARES Act is a new program put out this year uh, to assist. Uh, businesses and ag producers during the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Our regular B, uh, business and industry guarantee program that is always there, it's been there since 1972. We typically loan, uh, for loan purposes include purchase and development of land, buildings, equipment, machinery, and supplies. We can do working capital. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. Eligible borrowers include for-profit businesses, nonprofits, cooperative, federal recognized tribes, and public bodies. Next slide, please, Mark. Uh, we use lenders in this program. It's guaranteed where the lender loans the money and we do a backing uh, of the loss that the lender would have. And there are some pre-approved lenders, which are any federal or state chartered bank, savings and loan, farm credit banks, and credit unions. Next slide, please, Mark. And then we're gonna hit the BNI CARES Act pretty heavy right here. Uh, next slide, please, Mark, please. Appropriated this year was $20.5 uh, million dollars in program supporting to up to a one point uh, one billion dollar in lending authority available until until September 30th, 2021. Um, notice of funding was published on May the 22nd. Next slide please Mark. And as I said earlier, uh, it's limited uh, loan purposes is for working capital. So this can be used for payroll cost, healthcare benefits, salaries, principal and interest payments, rents, leases, utilities, inventory, and supplies. The loans have a 90% guarantee of any of the bank's loss, and there's a 2% guarantee fee uh, charged to be able to receive the guarantee. This is also expanded to include ag production, half of that billion dollars, a uh, uh, little over uh, 490 million, uh, uh, million dollars has been uh, set aside just for ag producers. And in our regular program, our repayment for working capital is seven years and this uh, CARES Act program is going to extend that out to 10 years with a principal up to three years in, uh, deferral and interest up to one year. Capital and equity requirements, uh, we do have capital and equity requirements. Collateral discounting by the lender is not required in this program and the maximum loan amount is $25 million. Next slide, please. Like I said, the uh, big thing on this is the principal is deferred for three years and you only have to pay interest only. And I will say again that it's for payroll costs, healthcare benefits, salaries, principal and interest payments, rents, utilities, inventory, and supplies. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. Um, eligible BNI borrowers are defined in 7 CFR 4279.108. Agriculture producers are eligible borrowers with conditions. And the BNI CARES Act borrowers must have been in operation on or before February the 15th, 2020. Next slide, please, Mark. Loans must uh, be to cover costs to prevent, prepare, and respond to the coronavirus pandemic. Loans for working capital to support agricultural production, including independent agricultural production, are eligible. If the applicant's loan request exceeds the Farm Service Agency's guaranteed loan authority, or the applicant's request is not eligible for an FSA loan. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Also, uh, this can include taxes and utilities, business inventory, agritoxin expenses, uh, <clears throat> including inventory, feed, seed, fertilizer, chemicals, livestock, and other supplies. Marketing, uh, shipping, and other expenses incurred through normal business operations or such additional expenses due to the national pandemic. Loan costs and essential loan related items can also be included in the loan. Next slide, please, Mark. These loans cannot be used for business acquisition or purchase of land, equipment, construction, or other capital expenses, refinancing unless such debt refinancing is for debts incurred sub subsequent to February 15th for eligible purposes. Um, next slide, please. Loans to one borrower, including guaranteed or unguaranteed portions, the outstanding principal and interest balance of any business and industry guaranteed loan, and the new loan cannot exceed $25 million. You can apply for a CARES Act loan, and if there's money still available and you need more money, you can reapply. Loans shall be based on cash flow analysis, must not be greater than the amount needed to cure the problem caused by the uh, pandemic so that the business is uh, reestablishes on a successful basis. Next slide, please. The maximum loan amount of the BNI's CARES Act loan program for working capital purposes may not exceed 12 times the borrower's total average monthly cost of eligible working capital loan purposes less the total amount of any SBA PPP loan or federal emergency assistance received. Borrowers receiving the CARES Act program loans an amount less than the maximum eligible amount in accordance with the above paragraph may apply for, for, for subsequent loans under this section. Next slide, please. And that just sort of tells you and shows you, I'll let you look at that for a second. But it's actually what your expenses were last year or whatever, normally what your typical expenses were and then during COVID what your expenses were would be the difference minus any PPP money, which would be the eligible loan amount for the CARES Act funds. Next slide, please. These loans won't be uh, dispersed with one disbursement. They'll be supervised, held at the bank and escrow, and loan proceeds will be dispersed through multiple draws on an as-needed monthly basis. As I said, there's a 10 year uh, maximum loan and one, up to one year principal and interest deferral and extended principal deferrals. Next slide, please, Mark. Loans must be adequately secured. Collateral discounting by the lender is not required for the BNI CARES Act loans for working capital purposes. 
the value to collateral, the fair market value must be equal to or greater than the amount of the loan amount. Next slide, please, Mark. Appraisals of real estate and chattel collateral are required when the amount of the loan exceeds a million dollars unless the chattel is newly acquired equipment and the value supported by a bill of sale. And the agency will accept appraisals older than one year uh, but completed within two years of the application date. Lenders may provide an updated appraisal in lieu of a new complete appraisal when the original appraisal is more than two years old. And a uh, actual site inspection inside is not required. Next slide, please. Uh, the borrower needs to show a 10% balance sheet equity. Uh, balance sheet equity that includes owner contribution capital of 10% or more of total fixed assets. The business must invest, of, uh, must invest other funds into the project equal to 10% or uh, more total eligibility project costs. In other words, in a regular program, we are looking at tangible equity. In this program, we're just looking at straight equity of 10%, which is your uh, <clears throat> assets minus your liabilities divided by your assets will give you that. Uh, hopefully, you will meet 10%. Next slide, please. And this is just an example we put in. So what, if somebody asks for the PowerPoint, they can have it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Loans for working capital are classified as category exclusions for the purpose of agencies' environmental requirements. So we do a NEPA environmental uh, review on all of our projects, but this will be a, what we call a category exclusion since it's for working capital and it is not a long drawn out process. A draft loan agreement is not required at the time of the applications. A uh, business plan is not required. Lenders may substitute and rely on the borrower's tax returns when financial statements are prepared in accordance with GAAP are not available from the borrower, and ag producers' financial records must meet the industry standard accounting practices. And if it is a smaller loan than 600000 we hope that we use the simplified application. Next slide, please, Mark. Uh, the applications are received and processed in our, our Richmond State Office. Uh, funds will be maintained in the National Reserve and the agency will consider applications on where they are received. Toward the end of the funding pe uh, period, uh, the agency will assign a priority point system for limited remaining funds and the purpose of the agency will com uh, compare an application to other applications. Right now, since this is a new program, uh, all, every application has been funded so far. Next slide, please. The aggregate total amount of loans for agricultural production will be initially be limited to 50% of the total amount of program level in BNI CARES Act, which came out to approximately $475,500,000. The agency may publish future notices in the Federal Register. Next slide, please, Mark. Also in this program, if you have the CARES Act working capital, but if you want to purchase land or equipment or whatever, we can group the uh, application uh, into one application with their regular BNI program. BNI program, regular BNI program and the CARES Act program can be uh, intertwined, grouped together. Next slide, please. And we have resource links and contacts. Next slide, please. These are our regulations, notice of, notice of available funding, and our website. Next slide, please, Mark. 
state office and points of contact in our national office were Aaron Morse and David Chestnut. Um, and next slide, please. And this is my contact information and feel free to either email me or call me uh, with any questions. I'll be glad to give you any information uh, that you asked for and assist you in any way. And that's all I have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Joe, uh, for your presentation. Next, I will be talking about urban farming. Well, good morning again. My name is Diane Lenore Giles, and I am the Public Relations Specialist in Richmond, Virginia. Farm Service Agency serves over 41 counties across the state. At this time, I would like to give you a little information on our urban farming. Next slide, Mark, please. As you know, in 2018, the Farm Bill uh, directed Farm Service Agency, along with other USDA agency, to start a grant for urban farming. Urban agriculture, this is led by NRCS, and it work, we're working in partnership with numerous USDA agencies that support uh, agriculture. When you think about urban agriculture, you think about rooftop farming, container farming, sidewalk, just anywhere they can plant a seed. So the Agri Secretary of Agriculture said, okay, let's see if we get some grant funds out there to help those producers. So on August the 25th, the Secretary announced the first ever recipients for this grant. And those are Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production Competitive Grants, Cooperative Agreement for the Community, Compost and Food Waste Reproduction, Reduction. These grants are projected were highly competitive. We received more than 500 applications for those grants. Next slide, please. The competitive grants will strengthen existing programs and create new projects in focus areas of food insecurity, community gardens, urban farms, and controlled environment agriculture. As you can see, the total amount awarded was $1,114,000 in planning projects. So it was $1.14 million uh, given out for that project. The planning projects are for urban farms, local governments, schools, and our stakeholders to, to target areas for food access, education, business, and startup calls. Some of the recipients included Centers for Land-Based Learning in California, City for New Haven in Connecticut, and Feast Down, which is close to us in North Carolina. Also, he awarded $1.88 million to implement these projects. As you look below, implementing projects are for organizations to accelerate models of urban indoor and other agriculture practice that serve multiple farms and improve local food access. Emerging technologies, education and policy implementation. As you look at these wonderful recipients of these grants, you look at Arkansas Interfaith Power and Light, Association of African Living in Vermont, Common Ground to Producers and, and Growers, Family Co Foundation received the grant, the Greenleaf Foundation received one, and New York Sunworks also, Parkside Business and Community in Partnership in New Jersey received some of that money. Next slide, please. Urban and suburban committees. This is what I want to talk about today. Forming those committees. 
On August the 12th, the Secretary allowed FSA to announce five of the new urban and suburban FSA county committees across the United States. And he requested the five to be funded. Richmond, Virginia, which where I'm serving, and I'm hosting that urban and suburban committee. We're working with that committee out of New Kent. That committee will be housed out of the New Kent office. Some of you may call it the Four Rivers office or the Quentin office. Also, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania received one, Cleveland, Ohio, Portland, Oregon, and Albuquerque, New Mexico. The new committee will be will be stood up in two phase, phases. Phase one will be completed within the fiscal year 2020, and the next one will take place in 2021. The committees will be in place for five or more years, with three to 11 elected members to serve those three years. Under the general supervision of the state committee and and other eyes and ears of the urban and suburban producers, growers. The committees will represent the priorities of urban and suburban producers and growers and serve as voices in the community. Now we know we need voices in the community so we can see if we can get more funding. The urban and suburban agriculture committee will work on ways to encourage and promote urban indoor and other emerging agriculture practices. Additionally, the Urban County Committee may address areas such as food, access, community, engagement, support, or local activity, promote and encourage community and food and water reduction. Now, to be eligible for this uh, committee, uh, you must be a producer who owns and operate a farm or ranch in the area of Richmond area. We have two LLAs, so the area of Richmond, Virginia. Be a producer who participate or contribute in a nonprofit energy or organization. Also, you participate or cooperate with FSA and provided by law. Be a United States citizen and you must be 18 years of age. And you have to reside, just as I said, in the Richmond area to participate in one of those committees. Next slide, please. Why do you want to serve on this Urban Ag Committee? A question that probably has come up several times. I'm already on the local committee. Can I serve on that committee? No, you cannot unless you live in that area. So, Urban County Office Committee aboard a local farmers and ranchers, just like I stated. They're made up of local farmers. Urban County Office Committee members elected, just as elected by the local farmers. Urban County Office Committee report urban ags directly to the Secretary of Agriculture. Serving on the committee provides you an opportunity to educate fellow producers on USDA programs and participation requirements. Serving on the committee provides an opportunity to help make decisions to, that can impact our local farmers and ranchers. The new urban and, suburban and suburban farm service agency committee, just as I said, will play a vital critical role in advising farm service agency on how the programs meet the needs for the urban rules. Members will include your local farmers tied to urban agriculture, your inner practice, diversity, and also our historical underserved producers will be nominated by their peers. Now you have to nominate and the producers have to nominate these. Committees typically include three to 11 members, just as I said, and you usually serve three year terms. Next slide, please. Look at the nomination. Well, that nomination began on September the 8th and it will run through October the 2nd. So you still have time to get a nomination form and send it to the local FSA office, which is New Kent. Urban farmers who participate or cooperate in FSA program in the county selected may either be nominated 
Or you can nominate yourself. If you don't feel like someone else will nominate, nominate yourself. yourself. Organization also may nominate you. You talk about the organization like your local AARP, your local NWCP, your local Rotary Club, anyone can nominate you. To be considered, a producer must sign a form. Now, you just cannot call in and put your name down. You must sign a form, which is 669 nomination form. That's allowing, telling FSA, okay, I agree to serve on this committee. The form and other information are at the fsa.usda.gov slash election website. Or you can call your county office. Hey, could you send me a copy of the form? You can call me also, and I can send you a copy of the form. So all nomination form must be postmarked are received in the local FSA office by October the 2nd. Now, anything after October the 2nd, it, it won't be counted. It must be in a nomination if you want to be on that committee. Election ballot will be mailed out to eligible voters beginning that day. Now, you already got your nomination forms in. Now, you're getting ready to uh, put your names on the ballot if you, if you accept that position. You will have election ballot mailed out to you by October the 23rd. Next slide, please. Okay, I've already talked about what you need, what are requirements to hold an office. Just like I said, you have to be a producer who owns or operates a farm or ranch, be a producer who participates or contributes to your nonprofit entity or organization, participate or cooperate in any FSA programs provided by law, and you must be a citizen and at least 18 years of age resides or live in a jurisdiction that you will be serving. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just giving you an overview of the uh, general information on urban farming by food security, food security. and they're saying at least 23.5 million people likes living in the community for food access. 15.8 million of our children are food insecure in school. So that's the reason they're promoting this urban farming. Uh, so make sure our school, our children that's in school receive adequate lunches. This is especially true in many urban areas and it's typically caused by economic challenges that limit attraction, retail grocery stores, stores which reduce and eliminate food shopping options. Urban farms empower people to solve food access issued by the community by providing local grown fruits and vegetables. The farm also provides jobs for people in the community, beautify the neighborhood, and teach adults and children how to grow healthy food. Now, who wouldn't like to walk out in a garden every day, um, you know, when tomatoes are ripe uh, in season to get a good red ripe tomato? in your own garden. Urban farmers also practice conservation. They convert food waste into healthy soils, just as Keith Boy said about the soils. We had someone talk about the soils. So we all work in, come in connection together uh, about uh, minimize stormwater, runoff by capture rainwater, saves energy costs. There we go back again. We're, talking, we're running our information right back to rural development, how to save on energy costs. That would, all, would otherwise be used for long distance transportation of food items, create more in our city. So what we're saying that we need more farmers market. We need more urban growers in the, in the city of Richmond. Next slide, please. Okay, that is all I have on the urban farming. This is new to the area of Richmond. I will be the chairman of that program so far, uh, working with the New Kent office. So if you know of anyone live in the Richmond area that's interested in serving on that committee, please have them give me a call so we can have that form sent to them or uh, they can request it from the website. Okay, next slide, please. And this is my contact information, uh, Diane Lenore Giles. Uh, Public Relations Outreach Specialist in the Virginia State Office in Richmond, Virginia. And this is my, um, I am working from home now. This is my office cell phone number, 804-246-1500. Uh, 
629-7189. That ends my presentation. And also I'm going to continue ask you to please fill out that survey that's in front of you because we would like to see if we can have more programs and you can invite some friends to um, zoom in so we can share our information. Uh, presenters, I would like to thank all of you for just participating in this group today, the session today. And I did see our friend Laurie Tucker on the on um, the feed. We would like to thank her also. Joe, you did a great job. So we know you and Laurie work together in Phil. But thank you very much for participating, all of you. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. I see one in the chat box. Uh, Mark, let's see what that one is. Okay, uh, it says any urban farm support to areas such as Petersburg or Tri-Cities area? No, we have not reached out there in that area for support. The only local area that we have now will be in the city of Rich Richmond. It may be extended later down the road, but not urban farmer would not be in that area that you receive funding from the government as of yet. Okay, I just put the survey in the chat box. So if everybody who's been watching this presentation, if you could just take a moment to fill that out. And you, you could do it after the presentation also. Okay, Mark, that is all I have. Uh, Derek, do you have anything to close us out with that we would like to thank you very much for allowing us to work with you and Mr. Carter and also Mark for doing this presentation and we will work closer with BSU and helping us with these programs. Thank you, Derek. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank everybody for joining the meeting and I hope you have a wonderful day and I'm hoping that we'll get all your contact information.